welcome everyone to, to this particular session. Uh, we've been doing these sessions uh, every week. And tonight I've got my good friend Nick from South Africa. I've worked with Nick over the past how many, 15 years now, close to 15 years. Uh, Nick is a specialist uh, consultant in business process re-engineering, balance scorecard, and uh, performance management especially. So Nick will take you through the best time to, uh, to implement the balance scorecard. Uh, and at the end, uh, I'll give uh, participants an opportunity to ask questions, Nick, uh, at the end. I would like to also to urge everyone to accept Nick to, 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 to take out your videos so that we don't congest the, the network. Sometimes it can slow down the system. Uh, so that uh, the person who's presenting can be the only one appearing on video, like now. Uh, um, so Nick, I, I hand over to you to, to take us through this. Uh, people can put their questions on, on the chat uh, and I can ask those questions or uh, they can ask those questions directly when I open the session for questions, for question and answer. It's over to you, Nick. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, just excuse the COVID-19 hairstyle because you can't get it cut. Okay, let's talk about the best time to implement the balanced scorecard. Uh, I want to give you background first of, as to why I'm making this statement currently. First of all, what does the future hold for us? New ways of working. We're hearing, and it's not one person, but it's a number of people are saying, we will not go back to the way we used to work. Things are going to change. We see accelerated on online retail. JC Penney has just filed for bankruptcy in the United States. In South Africa, Ed has a filed for business rescue. We're starting to see these things happening. More disruptions due to climate change. Just see Bay of Bengal at the moment. We saw the fires in Australia, the locusts in East Africa. All of these things are happening rapid technological advancements. I want to quickly share with you a video of just what's happening currently. If it will open. Just a, a small piece of technology. No, I don't want this. Hey, okay, it won't open, but I'll make it available for you after the session. Okay, so that if we see the technological advances happening how quickly, what's interesting to me is my, my daughter is a scientist, and how quickly she says the scientific community has co collaborated and, and working on this problem. It's never been seen in the history, and we're going to see more of this happening in top technology, etc. Again, I think we still in some civil unrest. So once this has happened, the economies are going to be in trouble, and people are going to get very... Uh, full of anger in America, 30 million people claimed unemployment within the first month. So these things are going to happen. More demand from workers, from voters, from population, from governments. They're going to be demanding accountability from our leaders. They're going to ask for accountability. Now, how do you become accountable? How do you prove that you've, you're doing your best? You better have a robust way of showing them what is your intention and how well you are, uh, are proceeding to get to that, atten uh, to, to that goal that you want to set? Okay, so what did we experience from COVID-19? Economic disruption, as I've spoken about, massive job losses at this stage. Uh, company failures, we've spoken about that. We see the airlines are starting to talk about uh, going into business rescue, some of the, the, the uh, very profitable ones like Comair, etc., are having problems. Government is unprepared. We're seeing they were unprepared for this thing that's going to happen. It was something that was in China and then suddenly it was all over the world. Lack of accountability by leaders. It's amazing to me how quickly we people were able to say, okay, unfortunately we can't pay. We're going to have to, 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 to dismiss workers, etc. Where is that accountability? Where was your planning to put in place something for times like this? Our politicians. It was a lovely in South Africa when our president says he's going to cut his salary by a quarter. Now, you know, for a person that earns 4.5 million, a quarter is not going to make you hungry. But for a person that's earning 5,000, it is going to make you hungry. So things like that, accountability at the end of the day. When discussing uh, 
the pandemic leaders will say, but who could have foreseen such an event? That is what corporate governance is telling us. We have to see these events. From our corporate governance, we're seeing financial capitalism, inclusive capitalism, inclusive finance, only a small portion of activities. We stop just watching that. Amazing enough, when things are going well, all the people are looking at is the bottom line. They're not looking at tomorrow, etc. What investments are being made in the future? Our healthcare systems. I know the South African one, which is maybe one of the better ones, is in, in a shambles. The Zimbabwe one, as far as I've read in the papers, in a shambles. Isn't these things that our leaders should have made sure that at least they could look at an epidemic, never mind a pandemic, and so on. So inclusive, efficient, productive use of capitals. When we talk about the capitals, is the six capitals. It is things like your human capital, your financial capital, your manufacturing, your intellectual capital, your, your environmental capital, is that leaders need to start understanding it is not all about the bottom line anymore. It's about sustainability. Traditional accounting methodologies does not measure the six capitals. It measures the financial side. We see your traditional strategies. We're all aimed at the financial, the customer kind of perspective, not at what we're investing internally, not how we're investing in our people. What interests me so much, and Memory's written a few articles on this that I've seen, was how we treat the workers. How easy it is to say we will retrench our drivers, we will retrench our clocks forgetting that that driver that delivers to your customer is most probably the person that meets your customer the most, that interacts with your customer the most. How easy is it going to be to replace that person? Not his driving capability, but his interaction with those people. Short-term, long-term thinking. Again, it comes back every time. Is short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. This pandemic didn't just happen overnight. If we looked at all the things that were happening right from uh, level five hurricanes that was hitting us, storms that hit Europe last year that was never seen before, the fires in Australia, all of these things are telling us there are major disruptions coming. What are we doing to plan for that? What are we doing to ensure that we have sustainable, robust organizations that can cope with these things? that can withstand these things. That is what we've got to look at. So that longer term thinking needs to be coming into to clear focus at the moment that we have to make sure that we think of not only today, but think of tomorrow, think of four years, five, six years down the line. Now people will say to me, you know, you understand the Zimbabwe economy and all the issues you're having. We're in survival mode. We don't even know what's going to happen four or five years down the line. Problem is that is, that's no excuse. You've got to say, how do I, in the current scenario, start planning for the future? How do I take uh, cognizance of the new technologies? How can I leverage the new things that are coming to ensure sustainability, first of all, and then growth when, when things change, when when the world changes. It's interesting to me what I when I saw Japan uh, has uh, put aside two billion dollars for Japanese companies to move their production out of China. They did not say back to Japan. They said out of China. What better opportunities will there be to try and attract them to Africa? to where we've got the people, where we've got the raw materials, to beneficiate raw materials here. What we see is a fairly successful story is the automotive industry in South Africa. Now, a lot of the, 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 the companies in the, in the world have moved a lot of their, their production here. Australia has lost all their auto manufacturing because of productivity issues in Australia. South Africa, we've seen investments at BMW of 7 billion, at, at Nissan of 5 billion, at Cities of 11 billion, at Volkswagen of something like 6 billion. 
That's the long-term thinking we've got to look at now. Focus on unintended consequences of our performance indicators. Again, Allen Scorecard is a massive tool that can be used very effectively. But we must look at each performance indicator and needs to look at what are the risks attached to that performance. If I want on-time delivery to my customer, I need to look at the risk for quality for arguments or the risk of the cost that it's going to do and start measuring these things across. And, and Balance Scorecard allows us to do that. And the way it's set up, make sure that we focus on holistic business approach or organizational approach. Okay, so we must look at those things coming down the line now. Strategy. Now, the sins, uh, the three uh, sins of the corporate world, uh, okay, needs to be broadened. Our strategies needs to look at, at a bit wider things, not just inputs and outputs. Outcomes of products and services. We need to look at how is what we're doing going to impact on our society. We're seeing society is starting to demand more and more from organizations. Big problems that they're having. In the United States, in 1954, I think, they did a survey, found out that about 52, 3% of the population was working in the manufacturing sector. That same survey done in 2012, I think, found out that they only had 5% of their population was in the manufacturing se sector. They had lost everything to offshore manufacturing. Society is starting to say, hang on a second. If you want to sell your goods here, make them here, create jobs here. The environment, interesting. Now with these lockdowns worldwide, how suddenly people could see the sky, how suddenly people can breathe again. Now the, the clear indication of how we are messing up the environment. Positive negative impact on the value of creation. How do we create value in our organizations? Not just positive, but also what negative impact could we have? Reduction uh, of our reputation. We need to look at that in terms of our uh, strategy. Whatever we do, how is that going to enhance our reputation or reduce our reputation? Very often we find very sound businesses are going under today because of a reputational issue. The big problem we have currently is the social media, that thing that everybody loves so much, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, all of these things, allows your consumer population, your population within minutes to know what's going on. How do we actually enhance that reputation? How do we make sure that whatever is put out there is positive? That should be part of our strategic thinking in the future and the trust from society. This where people have lost jobs, where people have lost the income, suppliers have lost income, all of these things is going to put a massive, um, I would say, strain on trust relationships that we've had in the past. So easy when things went wrong that we just uh, ran away and said, well, it's COVID or it's lockdown, it's not my fault. How am I going to trust you in future? If something comes along, are you going to do the same thing? as a staff member, as a supplier, as a customer even. These are things we've got to start looking at. I hope this one will open. Um, I just want to go and quickly open this just to show you what I've done in order to try and broaden in the balance scorecard format, uh, broaden the um, strategic thinking. Uh, just let me find that quickly. Okay. In the template, you'll see these are the templates that, 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 that are, I'm going to make available in this environment. So strategy, again, we look at financial, your growth income, change how we charge for our products, things. These are just suggested uh, strategic objectives. But cost management, ensure adequate reserves for emergencies. Those are the kinds of things that we've got to start looking at. How much money are we putting aside? Are we making sure is in place for these kinds of 
these things. From a customer perspective, I've broken it again. There's customers and stakeholders. Improve relations with suppliers. Comply to environmental requirements. Support the society within which you operate. Improve relations with government. How many times do we see commerce and government at loggerheads? Instead of working together, we're going to start seeing it happening now that they, we all have to work together in the future. Otherwise, both will fail. Uh, when we look at your, your process things, operations is a normal thing, but then look at implement customer relations, the process, improve marketing, uh, risk management, again, one of the things, disaster management and business continuity. That should be part of your strategy to make sure these things are in place. And then from a human capital point of view, improve knowledge retention. Instead of just getting rid of people, think of what the knowledge is. Don't think because it's a low-level worker that they don't have a, a lot of knowledge. As I said, they very often the, the, the people that see your customers the most and interact with your customers. And then from a technology point of view, cost-effective technology, ensure protection of information. You're seeing more and more acts being put out that information needs to be protected. Not only customer information, but organization's information. Implement IT uh, disaster management and business continuity plans. So that was just the uh, template that I put together for the disaster management side that I'm developing at the moment. Okay, so let's get to the ethical leadership part. How is, are we going to get people there. Ethical leaders involves anticipation and prevention of negative consequences on economy, society, and environment. How many of our current leaders can today say they actually did this homework? One of the companies that I read about was a case study was Caterpillar in 2017, 2007. This new CEO told all their ne ne his next levels, you must make a plan so that if we lose our 50% of our income tomorrow, how are we going to survive? When 2008 came along, they were able to move that whole business from uh, predominantly selling new equipment to maintaining the equipment. And they grew percentage-wise faster than Apple did through that uh, period from 2008. How many of us are actually doing these things? Secondly, how many of our leaders are actually involving the people in the company in anticipating and planning for what can go wrong? Effective leadership looks at results driven. Again, results driven. What does balance scorecard measure? Results. We see many strategies, and I've done quite a few workshops in Zimbabwe where I've looked at a lot of the people's strategies. Man, they're beautiful documents, 70 to 100 page documents. But when you really go into it, you cannot really see what is the end result we're striving for. Balance scorecard forces you to say, what is it we're looking for at the end of all of this, of doing uh, uh, investigations, writing reports, all of that, all input. What is the end result? How many more hospital beds are we going to be have available? How many new schools are going to be built? How many bits of roads is going to be fixed? How much product additional am I going to sell? These are the things we're looking at. And that is what things like the balance scorecard starts looking at. I speak at a number of corporate governance conferences as well. And one of the things that really surprises me at times is how often governing bodies, directors, senior people are sitting there and saying, I didn't know, because they did not have the information. Ensure accountability by having the information. A governing body is not supposed to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. However, they need to have up-to-date information as to what is happening. Getting a, 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 a pack every quarter giving you ideas, which is filtered information, incidentally, um, giving you these things. Within three months in today's world, a lot can go wrong. Sign off in South Africa, I think most of you might have heard of them, multi, multi-millionaire company. Within three months, was in trouble because 
then it came out that they were building a pyramid scheme within. Yet the directors did not pick it up. The governing body did not pick up what the CEO was doing. Now, in my mind, there's some basic things. If you've got a dashboard and you're suddenly making a lot of money, then there has to be things that tells me, but what input, what processes are we very good at? How come we've got the, the same staff levels? How come we've got the same cost levels and we're making this profit? Something is not correct. So we need to ensure that we've got that in place. Overseeing and monitoring, another thing that we're seeing ethical leadership is not about just uh, delegating, but it's also overseeing and monitoring. Having these dashboards available where I can start seeing trends, even if it's small, I can start seeing a trend and I can start asking the correct questions, etc. Okay. So now, governance performance indicators. And we see this in governments now, where they said, Performance measures that support outcomes across the triple context of all capitals. And now it's not just measuring the financial. Because when the financials are looking good, that's when most people are relaxing, which is a time when you shouldn't relax. You should always ask the questions, why are we doing so well? What input did we do? What are we doing differently? What's happened in the marketplace? Etc. in order to explain why we're doing well. But when things are going well, nobody asks the difficult questions. When they start going badly, they want to ask the questions. It's too late. It should have been asked long ago. Departure from linking remuneration to financial performance only. And looking at the overall. One of the most successful implementations that I did on the balance scorecard was an FMCG company, a very large company. The CEO, once we did the level one card, took it to his board and his board says, I like this. And they picked 10 measures out of all the measures that he had or 10 objectives and said, if you do not meet the targets on these, we reduce your bonus by 10%. He then went and did that to his own directors. He moved that organization from a 30 million loss on a 3 billion rand turnover to a 200 million profit within three years by making sure people are focused on results and not only the remuneration but the inputs that uh, the the process improvements the, the people skills improvements the technology all of these things report regarding performance measures and targets used as a basis for awarding a, a variable remuneration Seeing more and more people are looking at variable remuneration. Unfortunately, that remuneration is still attached to the financials. So in year one, two, and three, financials are not so good. People get, the, the, get disillusioned and not understanding. That's when we build for better financials in four, five, and six. Performance me against measures, workplace example, employee equity, fair remuneration, etc. Economy, transformation, prevention, detection, response to fraud and corruption, society, example, public health, safety, consumer protection, environment, pollution. These are some of the performed things that we've got to start measuring because society is going to start demanding it from organizations. Strategy and performance, principle four. The governing body should appreciate that the organization's core purpose, its risk and opportunities, strategy, business model performance, and sustainable development are all inseparable elements of the value creation process, not the dividend creation process, not the end result only, but the value creation over time process. Recommended practices to do that uh, should approve the policies and operational plans developed, include key performance measures and targets. We see this is now written into corporate governance. Principles is key performance measures and targets. But key, key is not just the financials. Management responsibility to implement and execute the approved policies and plans. Exercise ongoing on, uh, oversight in the implementation of the strategy. Ongoing. How does the governing body make sure they've got oversight? They need dynamic dashboards. Dashboards that tells them 
this month, this indicator did not hit target. Is there a plan in place? Should I ask questions about this? Is this an important issue that we need to follow up on? Organization continually assesses responsibility, responds, uh, responds and responsibility to responds to negative consequences. Cannot wait until things have happened. You've got to start looking in, in advance. I, I had the opportunity many years ago to, to, to visit a, a SA Breweries unit. It was like 15 people. Their whole job is to read newspapers, internet, etc., all the time, where they pick up anything which they believe could either be an opportunity or, or could have a future negative consequence. That was extracted and presented at every governing body meeting to say these are the trends we're seeing, these are the negative uh, uh, impacts we're seeing happening or, or rumors we're getting from that market. Bearing in mind that at that stage they were worldwide, they were in Eastern Europe, Africa, China, South America, etc. So they were picking up all these and already looking at what strategies need to be put in place should that happen. Should a country, for argument's sake, ban a certain alcohol or something like that, should happen? How many of our breweries actually now in South Africa are sitting, SA breweries, well, it's now AB and Imbe, we're talking about destroying 40 million liters of beer. A lot of us would have said, park it where we are. But yeah, that kind of stuff, because this is not in place, you understand. So organizations continue to assess response, response to, alert to general viability of the organizations with regard to reliance effects of the capitals and solvency and liquidity and its status as a going concern. Again, governing body there, leadership, accountability. Do you have the tools with which to do your job? Risk governance, principle 11, the governing body should govern risk in a way that supports the organization in setting and achieving its strategic objectives. Risk oversight, risk and opportunities from the triple context of the capitals. Gain, what risks are being managed? Not just we have appointed somebody, go and manage the operational risks. Strategic risks are where you lose the farm. Which of our strategies are not going to be uh, uh, implemented because of something that's happening. Assessment of the potential upside of or opportunity. Risk has got an opportunity normally there for those people that have done things like SWOT analysis would say for every uh, uh, opportunity there's a threat and for every threat there's opportunities. Again, how many people were ready to actually be flexible enough to take the opportunities of that come? A company that I'm aware of, they are in the lighting business, lighting for movie sets and TV and all of this. When this happened, they were able to use their skills to start setting up tunnels where people get disinfected. They walk through the tunnel, there's, there is um, sensors like they use on the lights, etc. As soon as they move through, they, they, they uh, jets squirt them with a fine mist of disinfectant. They were able to actually move their business to survive that way. How many of our businesses, how many of our organizations are ready for that? An assessment of dependence of, on the resources and relations of the various capitals we've spoken about. Design and implementation of risk responses. How do we uh, respond to these things. Uh, what is our designs on these things? Uh, you know, when I do a, do a lot of facilitation of, of um, workshops, one of the things I ask the question of, and, and it's, it's amazing how I used to ask this question, if one of your staff should be diagnosed with Ebola, what is your plan? And most of the people said, we have no idea. We have never thought of that. Unfortunately, this is much worse, not worse, I'd say, but uh, this thing happened now where what I've been asking for five, six years, 
have now suddenly have nobody was in place to do these things. If you had a balanced scorecard in place, you would have looked at your risk management. One of the things that you would be measuring as a governing body is not only do we have a risk management section in place, but do we have a business continuity plan? And is it actually practiced? Everybody decided now with, with this pandemic, with this lockdown, we are going to go work it out. Very nice. Nobody's actually sat down and said, but is it that simple? When you go and work at home and there's a question, you can't walk next door and speak to your colleague. You've now got to try and get hold of your colleague. If you want to speak to two or three people, you can't just quickly call a meeting. You've got to actually arrange a Zoom meeting with everybody when it suits everybody. So suddenly it slows down. Secondly, you're working with your organization's data, etc., on your machine in an unsecure environment. If you are in the financial area of an organization, what could happen if somebody knew you were there and you were, for argument's sake, the person that, uh, that is involved in moving money around? Could they come and create a problem for you in some way? You understand? Information that is available in paper format. How would I do it from home? So all of these things that look nice, let's move and go work at home. All the risks associated with that was not looked at. If it was practiced, we would have had things in place to make sure that these things are looked after. But it wasn't. If we, if we had to actually look at it and occasionally say to our people, go work it out. Let's see what are the issues that we've got to deal with. Should we have to do this in a crisis? How many of us, if we lose our production facility, has got any means of actually moving that production to a supplier, to a even opposition company to help out while it's happening? Have we put these things in place? That to me is what we need to start doing with the balance scorecard at this stage. Okay, establishing the implementation of business continuity arrangements, allowing for organizations to operate under conditions of volatility to withstand and recover from acute shocks. The integration and embedding of risk management in the business activities and culture of the organization. Do we, our people, when they do their job, think of what can go wrong? Do they just do it until it goes wrong and then it's, oops, I didn't think of that. Oops, I'm sorry. Now, let's look at strategy and performance. Now is the time to implement a robust performance management system. I, unfortunately, still hear all the time when I ask people, do you have a performance management system in place? Many people say yes. Then the second question I ask is, are you happy with your performance management system? 80 to 90% of the people says it is rubbish, it does not work, it does not motivate us. It is a stick to beat us with. To me, it has to be a robust system that we start putting in. That not only measures our people, it measures our leaders. We're seeing from corporate governance, they're now also saying governing, governing bodies need to have their performance assessed. But assessed against what? It says against what I'm saying, robust measures, measures that are attainable, measures that are real. Okay, so leaders need to recognize it is not going to be business as usual of the COVID is gone. It is not going to be. The, if you're looking at a shrinkage of economies, like predicting Britain is down by 10%, again, these are all predictions. I find that, you know, you get lies, 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 and then stats. So, but something is going to be different, you understand. How are we going to tackle that? How are we going to make sure that, first of all, we think about it, that we get our staff, our whole organization, to think of ways of how we're going to do this. New strategies are going to be required. I remember in 2008, Jimmy Diamond, I think of, of uh, I forget, the Irving Trust, one of these big uh, organizations in the United States, was saying he was so surprised how many people clung to their old strategy 
sitting on the railway line while the train is coming down to hit them, not realizing that you need to change. We're going to have to, and we're going to have to do it now <clears throat> so that when things change, when new opportunities come, we're ready for that. New types of leadership is going to be necessary. We're going to see the inclusive leadership is going to be, but that does not mean we're going to have leaders that are, are not going to have to take strong decisions, hard decisions, but decisions based on information, based on strong data. What I'm finding very frustrating at this point in time is all the different things that are coming out. Each person looking at figures, etc., on around this virus and coming up with this prediction, that prediction, because they don't have that data yet to make those decisions, etc., or make these predictions. So new strategies are going to be required. New types of leadership is going to be necessary. Uh, our, our new leadership is going to have to be agile. They're going to have to understand. We most of us are not going to know what is coming. So it's not going to be that I am an engineer in an engineering company and this is going to happen in engineering. It's going to be is what new technology can I leverage? How will we leverage us? Who do I need to help me? Who do I need to, to attract to my organization? Who do I need to nurture? What uh, things do I need to do? Inclusivity with all stakeholders will be required as the new world is imagined in development. Again, we're going to have to get close to people like our suppliers, like our customers, like our staff, like our bankers, like our governments. Say, so how do we together change this world? How do we actually revive a new world that's coming in an unstable climatic scenario, in an unstable economic scenario? How do we do these things? Measures will be required to assist in course adjustments where strategies are not providing the desired results. That thing that we're going to put a strategy in for four years is most probably not going to be enough. We're going to have to look at long strategics, but be able to adjust very quickly in between. If a strategy is not doing, we need to adjust these things. We need that. And that is what the balance scorecard needs to give us. That plan, do, review cycle. We're not achieving. What are we going to plan? We do. We review. If it's not working, is this the right strategy? Do we need to change direction? Then three months, as I said, is too long. From For governing bodies especially, from one board meeting to the next meeting, it's just too long. You need to have information to be able to ask the right questions so that adjustments are made quickly in the new world that's coming out down the line. So balanced scorecard implementation, again, many will say, we don't have the time now while we are trying to cope with COVID lockdown. My answer is you have no choice. Make the time. Even if you have to work weekends now, get things in place. Doing what you used to be doing is not going to ensure survival or prosperity. We're going to have to look at how do we change what we're doing. PSC implementation should not be difficult, involved task, as simplicity ensures everybody is focused on the result, not the process. Too often when I've got involved with companies, they get bogged down in the process. It's not about being right. It's about putting something in place, which will tell you as soon as it's not right, that I can adjust and fix it. So your system should be, if I'm measuring something that's not telling me a story, how do I change it and put a measure in that is telling me what I need to know? That's what it is. We make these things too complicated. We need to be simplistic. It needs to be able to, the driver needs to understand how whatever they do impacts on the company. Whatever they see, whatever they hear, how can they feed it back to the company to, to change things? New strategies are going to be required and leaders better get going. A crisis is a terrible thing to waste. There will be new opportunities to exploit for those who are prepared. Then too many scorecards, list objectives that are meaningless to the average frontline employee. Very important issues that you've got to look at. Then, 
balanced scorecard, now is the time to decide on the new direction, to define how we will know we are on the right path, right objectives, the measures, etc. There's not going to be necessarily an immediate right path, but at least you know I'm going in the right direction and I need to just adjust my, my focus a bit here and there. How to become agile? How do we become agile in our thinking? We're seeing trends in the world now where permanent employment is becoming uh, less and less the norm. Where people are saying, I, in order for me to be agile, I need a small core of permanent employees and a large network of people that can come and do certain tasks whenever I need it. I don't need to have somebody that can sit and do my payroll. I can bring somebody in that can do my payroll for a week. I can bring somebody in that can manage a project for me. I can bring in my maintenance from outside. I don't have to have a maintenance person on site all the time. So all of these things, are, we start to see differences. Staff need to start realizing this Cradle to grave opportunities. My father worked for the company. I work for the company, etc. For the next 50, 60 years, most probably not going to be around any longer because companies are not even going to last that long. As technology changes, things like that, companies will disappear. Those that are not agile, those that do not think of the future, they will disappear and be replaced by younger companies. We see here in South Africa, very interesting case study, been going on for a while, was an upstart called Capitec Bank. It started, everybody ignored them. Today, oh, they are the third biggest bank in South Africa, simply because they changed the whole model, electronic, etc. Now we've got five or six of these banks that's now climbing on the bandwagon. The traditional banks are closing branches, etc., because they were too comfortable in their business model. Okay. So prepare to prepare for future disruption. This is not the first. There's going to be more disruptions. They could be climatic disruptions. They could be economic disruptions. They could be pandemics. We don't know, but they're coming. We need to be agile enough to do this. Uh, going back to that Japanese example, where immediately the government says, we cannot be reliant and we're going to see this again happening all over the world. So Donald Trump has been trying to do it. People are not listening. I don't necessarily subscribe to his his methodologies but people have been he's been saying we are too reliant on china and we're seeing that a lot of this is going to move we in africa have the opportunity to take over those things provided we stabilize our governments we stabilize things we stabilize our workforces to understand you have to earn that dollar or whatever that you earn. When, once we've got that in place, I foresee that Africa has got a massive opportunities here. We have the raw material. It's not going to take too much to beneficiate that material, to stop manufacturing, all of these kinds of things. We've got the people. We just need to now get our ducks in a row and prepare for this future that's coming. Rebuild trust in our stakeholders is going to start happening then and to create a reputation of can do while ensuring that we do it sustainably. We're going to have to do these things in the future. Thank you for your time. Stay safe. Let's build a new Africa that will shut the terms of this world up. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick, uh, for, for the presentation. I'll ask you questions first, then I'll open this session to others. Okay. Yes. Um, what? What? Uh, yeah. Let's go back to the implementation of the the balanced scorecard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first question is, uh, most companies, you know, the original balanced scorecard has got those four perspectives: the financial, customer, internal business process, and dealing and growth. Yeah. Is it? Is is there? Is there anything wrong with adding your own as a company? For example, you may be mining, and someone wants to want to add environment and other things. No, I, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. All that I'm saying is do not just add something where you cannot see how it has a cause and effect on the others. In other words, if I add in, uh, let's say, something like health and safety, you understand, I need to be able to ask the question, what 
what is this doing in value creation? If I don't have health and safety, what would be the impact on my organization? Well, that will impact on, for argument's sake, the reputation that I don't look after my staff, which will then impact on my customers saying, well, if they don't look after their staff, how well are they going to look after their customers? If I then, the customers think that, they're not going to buy my product, which will impact on my financial. So as long as you can see a cause and effect, that it has effect on the holistic, the whole of the company. That's why they brought the six capitals to say human resources. And you could even have the six capitals, the financial, the manufacturing, the environment, society, etc. As long as you can see how the one impacts on the other, it's not a standalone. The moment it becomes a standalone issue, if you like, or strategy, it's going to be ignored. Okay, you were talking about, um, I think what you're highlighting is the issue of the strategy map. How important yep. is the strategy map in the implementation of the balance scorecard? Uh, to me, it's first of all a very succinct, clear, one page document that makes people see, first of all, what we're trying to do, see the linkages. You understand? They don't get lost in verbiage. Mm -hmm. It's easy to explain to the entire staff, provided we use simple language in these things to me the the strategy map is is, is a very potent tool mm. as opposed to a big fat document it's a very succinct easy to read thing and to be able to for me as as for arguments like the production person to see how i fit into the picture that makes us money eventually mm -hmm. yeah the, 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 the my last question is on the you talked about a list of useless measures that uh, have no connection to to the strategy yeah. how, do you, uh, organize, how can organizations make sure that they got the right uh, measures uh, in the scorecard to me first of all the, the the two things that i see all the time is at the call the level one the, the company scorecard we measuring measures that should be measured at say level three at divisional or at at even branch level mm -hmm because we, too, we want too much. We need to be able to, to measure at the right level, first of all. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can hear you. At the right level. Mm -hmm. Second, every implementation I've done, we always start with too many measures. I don't mind that. As long as we constantly critically ask ourselves a question, is this telling me something when I measure this? Mm -hmm. Can I do something about it if I'm not achieving target on it? If the answer is no to both, then get rid of it. Mm -hmm. like, let me give you a simple example. People would say, let's measure the exchange rate. Can you do something about the exchange rate? No, you can't. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. What is it telling you? Well, you can go read the paper every day. It's not going to tell you anything. What you need to say, okay, what is the impact of the exchange rate on my business? Should I not rather be measuring how much imported product am I using and can I reduce my reliance on an imported product? Now it will stop telling me a story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any measure that doesn't tell you uh, what to do or doesn't <clears throat> you have no control over, get rid of it. But don't in the beginning too much about these things. Put them down. As time goes by, people will realize this is not helping us get rid of it or move it down to the level where it can be dealt with properly. Okay. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. My last question is on um, the balance between uh, your lead indicators and the leg indicators. Because sometimes you find that probably 99% of what you find on the scorecard is all leg indicators, uh, uh, which, which, which uh, may be showing a positive trend, but uh, may not tell you whether you will have a successful business tomorrow or not. Yeah. The big thing is why that is happening. And we're talking lag indicators, like your financial customer. Mm -hmm. Okay. They tell you what has happened and very often lulls us into a false sense of security. But the reason why there's very often more of those because we have been measuring them. They're easy to measure. You understand? When we start looking at the lead indicators, it becomes more difficult to measure. Let's take an example. Training of staff. Training the number of staff 
is not really, yes, it is a measure that, yeah, we've got a plan, we're going to train. To my mind, the difficult one is how effective is that training? That to me is more important than just training people, is how effective is that training? And those measures are difficult. To me, that measure should be, if I have trained somebody, how many people's performance, individual performance management has improved as a result of training? That becomes a bit more difficult to train because it's not normally data that, that we have sitting around. We've got to build that data. And sometimes we ignore it because it's difficult. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Let me open the session for others who may have questions. If you have got questions, please uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Memory. May I may I start? Yes, you can go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, uh, quite an informative uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, one or two questions from um, from a presentation on the balanced scorecard. Um, yeah framework of uh, performance management. Number one is, let's say you have um, uh, a, 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 a head, who is going to be my um, my assessor, for example. And yes. under him, there are two um, functions that are um, totally divergent. For yes. example, the head doesn't have um, uh, the technical know-how of how one of the functions operates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all that, and then he, he, he gives me a, a, a balanced scorecard according to his uh, understanding of what I'm supposed to do. Yep. Okay. Now, um, let me ask this question first. Mm -hmm. First problem I have with with what you're saying to me is number one, I am not a believer in individual staff members having a balanced scorecard. Okay. Because there's a lot of positions that have absolutely no financial responsibility. Yeah. Or do not touch the customers for argument's sake. Or mm -hmm. the financial guys get not, don't get involved with staff issues. You understand? So to me, the individual performance management agreement mm -hmm. needs to be related on what is the output of that position that I need in order for my unit to achieve mm -hmm its balanced scorecard objectives. So at a unit level, mm -hmm. I need to achieve a throughput of so many units of production. That person in the manufacturing, his individual, I need to measure him on how many units does he produce per day that will make up that big total amongst 10 others. But there's an engineer working in production as well. Mm -hmm. That impacts on that, you understand. So I've got to think, if the machine goes down, it stops my production, I cannot achieve my unit. So I've got to measure him on the uptime of the machines yes. in order for the units to be produced. So that means management should look at what does the scorecard need to, or my unit need to produce. Then each individual, how do they contribute to those measures? And then I measure them on that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, maybe question, Nick, right. before, before you, 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 you he answers, I think the other, what I picked from the question is, you've got a boss who uh, probably looking after two areas, who, uh, who is supervising a, an individual in a case where they have no full understanding of what happens. For example, let me give you a typical example. You may have an HR manager reporting to a finance director. Mm -hmm. and the finance director has no idea what must be the output of that HR. So they will have their own uh, uh, view of what should come out of HR, which may not even be strategic. So I think that's where his question was, was, was focused as well. We must just be very careful too. Mm -hmm. When we measure individuals, each individual's performance relates to, first of all, operations and ultimately to strategy. You understand? So, I can go on to my background as a project manager, for argument's sake, which I've done quite a bit of too. I can manage a project in a totally unrelated field that I know nothing about and I did. And people that were implementing laboratory management systems. I'm not a scientist. 
However, what was important for the organization was that they delivered their tasks on time, that they got signed off from the customers, that they did it within in the right uh, budget, you understand. So these are the things I'm measuring. The customer signs off, he got the right product. I don't have to know that the software can do this or that. The customer signs that off. You understand? Mm -hmm. So we must not get too confused as if you get a lot of people, uh, divergent people reporting to a manager. The manager needs to still look at that, either that unit, so there's the HR unit reporting to the financial manager. There's an IT unit, for argument's sake, very often. And then there's the finance part. You understand? So he needs to be able to look at each of those units to say, what is the unit supposed to output that will, first of all, obviously add to the, to the operations of the organization? And then how must they change what they do to support the strategy where we want to go to? If he's not able to do that, in other words, he doesn't know what HR should be doing, then he needs to get in a professional or a person that's got an HR background to come and assist him to do that. Okay. Does that's that it. answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, you can okay. uh, another portion of the question, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, I, I guess from what you, you, you said um, just now and what you said earlier that um, – Balanced scorecard is not for individual uh, performance um, management. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for that. And then um, what? what, are, what, what the, before we go, I just want to say it's yeah. the format of the balanced scorecard for individual. But on the balanced scorecard, each objective and measure has a person in that unit accountable to make sure that we achieve those objectives. Exactly. The moment I make them accountable for that objective or measure, mm -hmm. it automatically goes down to the individual performance management and carries the highest weighting. Yeah. You understand? That's how I link it to the the the, the, the unit balance mm -hmm. scorecard. Does it make sense? So if I've got 10 people working and I've got five or, or 10, 15 or 20 objectives, each one will have one or two objectives that they've got to drive. And that is a big part of what the performance management system or agreement is going to cover. Okay. Okay, get on to the next question, Prosper. Yeah. Then uh, I wanted um, your recommendation, for example, on the best uh, individual performance uh, management system uh, in your experience. And you're talking IT systems? No. Um, a framework. The framework, oh, framework, the best one. Is, okay, everybody, uh, you know, I'm not uh, hooked to systems. I'm a I'm person that says, let's make it work. The one thing that I don't like, that I'm seeing very often, is this one to five measurement kind of things, where you cannot score a one and you can't score a five. You understand? So then why, why is it not a two to four measurement system? Secondly, that the people that are being measured do not have very clear indicators of how they would be measured on whether they are a three, a four, or a five. So typically when I build these things, I try and say for the, the high or the, the major measurements, I try and put hard targets in. So if a person is a project manager, I want him to at least achieve 90% of all the tasks on time and I will measure them accordingly. You understand? That way, if he achieves 100%, he should be a 4 or a 5. If he achieves 90%, he's a 3 because he's average. He's doing what I'm paying him for. Okay. okay. Yeah. That yeah. clarity is to me the important thing. How do I move it? To me, any system you want to use, any system, as long as the person can measure themselves and walk into the assessment there and say, I've achieved, we agreed on 100, I, I, I achieved 110. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a good system because then it's motivation. I don't have to wait for you to assess me. I can assess myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm not meeting my target, I can come to you and say, I'm not meeting my target. What am I doing wrong? How do I fix it? Okay. Yeah,
Okay. Any other question? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nick.